St. Patrick's Day is upon us. A great excuse every year to get drunk and wear green. Well, I shall not give in to those urges, no matter how much you badger me on to do so. I fully know that nobody watches this show, and, uh, well, up yours. So, anyways, on the subject of St. Patrick, most people believe that he is responsible for bringing Christianity to Ireland. Well... It's partly true, but... Okay, you know what? Fine. If, if nobody's giving in to this stupid green thing... Here, green. Brown neck. Happy. Anyways. I'm sorry. Anyways, I figured that today we would take a look at the history of Christianity in Ireland and how St. Patrick did more than give an excuse to get intolerably drunk in March. Before Christianity, the Celtic people that inhabited Ireland were animists. They honored the forces of nature and the spirits that inhabited it. They had deities for hunting and spirits for weather and sky. When an individual died, he or she passed into the realm of the sun. Burial mounds like the one near Tara Hill outside Dublin are good evidence that the ancient Celts did revere the sun as divine. The beginning of Christianity in Ireland coincided with the end of the Western Roman Empire. Christian monks, wanting to be closer to God, built monasteries on the island as far west as the Aran Islands, like Skellig Michael. However, these monastic communities did little to convert the native people. The conversion of the Irish began with a blue-blooded deacon from Rome. His name was Palladius. Palladius was born in Gaul, and before becoming a deacon, he was married and had a young daughter. He accompanied Bishop Germanus to Britain, under the orders of Pope Celestine I, and from there ventured to Ireland, where he became the first bishop. He and his two companions, Sylvester and Solanus, attempted to convert the Irish around Leinster, but were banished by the king and went to Scotland, where Palladius died around the year 450. Where Palladius' job ended, St. Patrick's job began. Nobody knows the exact details of the life of St. Patrick. Our best sources come from the letters of disputed authenticity, and the years he lived are only rough estimates. Experts all agree, though, that he was a 5th and 6th century Christian missionary that worked around northwestern Ireland. But rather than talk about Patrick, I would like to talk about a different Irish saint an actual Irish saint, St. Columba. St. Columba, or Colm Keel as he was known in Irish, was born in Donegal around 521. He began his education at a monastery near Galloway, and moved from monastery to monastery learning Latin and Christian theology. Eventually he became a priest and took to studying scripture, but became involved in a quarrel with his old master Finian that led to a battle in which many men were killed. Columbo was threatened with excommunication, but was sent into exile and left Ireland. He landed in Scotland, where he set up the Abbey of Iona to continue writing scripture and convert the Picts living in Scotland. Columba died in 597 and was buried in his abbey that he created. During the second half of the first millennium, Irish monasteries were havens for education and conversion visited by scholars from all over the British Isles. King Oswald of Northumbria let St. Aidan of Lindisfarne convert his subjects. St. Columba's Monastery on Iona converted the whole of Scotland. Languages like Latin and Ancient Greek were preserved in the most remote of Irish monasteries. By the 800s, Charlemagne 
had Irish monks working in his newly established abbey schools, among them Johann Scotus Eugena. But then darkness rolled in. The darkness that rolled in? Vikings. Around the 9th and 10th centuries, Norse warriors pillaged and ransacked the countryside of Ireland, plundering everything in sight. The Irish monasteries, filled with golden ornaments, were the favorite targets for attacks. Inhabitants at the monasteries were either murdered or made slaves, and buildings were burnt to smoldering ashes. However, thanks to rulers like Charlemagne, the knowledge kept in these monasteries was preserved for the monks working in his abbeys. By the time the Norse invaders had ceased to invade, the Irish church was in shambles. St. Malachi of Arma did his best to reform the church, but died before it was finished. The worst was yet to come, though. When Henry Plantagenet was made King of England in 1154, he made it a point that civil law was supreme over ecclesiastical law. Pope Adrian IV, who was born in England, gave Henry permission to conquer Ireland, but Henry decided to wait, uh, murdering Thomas Becket in the meantime. Come 1166, Irish chieftain Diarmid MacMurchada asked Henry for assistance in regaining his lands, which Henry jumped on in a moment's notice. In 1175, most of the Irish chiefs submitted to Henry, setting up English rule. In 1536, though, Henry VIII declared himself supreme head of the church in Ireland, eventually putting forth reformation to the Church of Ireland. Elizabeth I consolidated English power in Ireland, and although the North turned to Protestantism, the South remained heavily Catholic, causing religious tensions that exist to this very day. While fraught with hardship, Christianity in Ireland has had a grand past of conversions, monasteries, and miracles, which are still recalled to this day. For more information on the early church, I recommend watching The Secret of Kells, directed by Tom Moore, which is a brilliant example of Irish art and animation, and a good look into the threat of the Viking attacks against the undefended monasteries in the area. Also, don't forget to visit your local library. For History and Review, I'm Captain Rutledge. Good day. This tie clashes with the suit.